man we all loved and a man who when he touched your life you knew you had been in the presence of someone special the desire of every professional athlete is to blaze a trail that is so long and wide that it would take a person to perform at a Hall of Fame level just to measure up. It strikes me that a man who committed larceny 938 times is being welcomed into heaven. Life does not often provide opportunity for a person to make a clean choice. I made a choice, a choice to follow my dream and to become a Major League Baseball player. You know, we have a sadness, but let's celebrate his life. Let's, if you know, celebrate his life. Like the procession on the day of his funeral, Lou Brock's life was a journey. It began in El Dorado, Arkansas, and moved next to Collinston, Louisiana. His early years were a hard scrabble existence in a family of sharecroppers. He never knew his father. He later said being poor never bothered him because, quote, if you don't have something, you don't miss it. As his mother remembered back in 1977, Lou grabbed onto the game of baseball and never let go. Baseball, Ray, cotton ball, rocks, everything you get to throw, playing ball. You made a rag ball for him, is that right? That's right. I made it a rag ball. I brought, I take a sock and roll it out of eight ball. He would earn an academic scholarship to Southern University in Baton Rouge. But then he set his sights on walking onto the baseball team. Emory Hines was his coach. Well, I said, well, go out there and right field. And let's see if you can chase some balls. He did. He went out there and he stayed out there about a half hour. And somebody said, Coach, you, you better go out there and right field. That, that fellow you sent out there is out on the ground. He had fallen out from heat exhaustion. He struggled at first, but by his junior year, he was a 500 hitter. His team won a national championship, and he was selected to play in the Pan American Games in Chicago. The following year, he was signed by the Cubs for a bonus of $30,000. And after only one minor league season, he was called up to the bigs. Guys batting here, the drive going deep to center field. Richie Ashman going way back in towards the bleacher area. And this one is hitting on top and into the center field bleachers. It's a tremendous wallop. Lou Brock with a monumental home run here at the polo ground. And the Cubs lead by a score of four to nothing. Moments like that came in frequently for Brock. He was struggling to hit 250 and provide the power the Cubs wanted from him. Meanwhile, the 1964 Cardinals were struggling too. Far behind in the pennant race with a big hole in left field where the retired Stan Musial played. On June 15th, manager Johnny Keane got his wish. Bing Devine sent pitcher Ernie Brolio for Brock as part of a six-player deal. Lou's new mission, ignite the offense from the leadoff spot. To say the least, he was the most. Now another man trying to score, and Brock is safe at the plate. The Cards' new catalyst propelled them to the pennant on the season's final day and into the World Series against the Yankees. The Cardinals are the new world champions. Stan the Man was in the victorious locker room, and someone mentioned that it was too bad Musial hadn't played one more year. Musial replied, if I played another year, the Cardinals don't win the World Series because we don't trade for Lou Brock. We celebrate the life of a very, very complex man, Lou Brock. Now, they're telling you about all the holiness that he had, and he did, and how humble he was and how kind he was. He was, but not on the field. I mean, he put the fear of God in the opposition. He was fearless. 
And he, he would go up to the catcher and he said, now you know I'm going to run on you. And he wasn't even on base yet. But they, they talk about his base stealing. This man had over 3,000 base hits. And if he wanted to be a home run hitter, he could have been a home run hitter. He was the toughest man I've ever met. I mean, he played for 19 years and he was never on the, we call that the disabled list, okay? Because when you were injured, you were disabled. You, you, you were nothing. Well, he was never on it. Never. And he's still running. God bless you all. I'm really happy that you're here to honor Lou because he was tremendous, man. Tremendous. God bless. much turn you loose uh, Lou as far as uh, you can go when you want to? Not really. We have a sign, Red and I, that he tell me not to steal. There do arrive time that uh, uh, I might hire two or three ball players to stand between Red and I so I don't get the sign. <laughs> <laughs> Lou Brock's journey took him to the World Series three times. In 1967, he became the first player to hit 20 homers and steal 50 bases in the same season. And then... Lou Brock was a one-man wrecking crew. He terrorized the Boston Red Sox. Four hits in game one and a 414 overall average with seven steals. The Cardinals were world champions again. The Cardinals were back in the series a year later Brock batted a sizzling 464 with another seven steals. Lou's lifetime average in World Series play, 391, is top for players with 75 or more at-bats. His 14 career steals and seven in one series are also tops on the list. Spring training is, uh, I guess, about my third year, and he had us all around first base, and. And I'm sitting there, I'm waiting for some good, you know, good, simple advice. And all of a sudden, Lou pulls out a stopwatch. He pulls out some string and he pulls out a tape measure. And I'm like, man, all I got to do is get a big lead and get a good jump. <laughs> you know, here we are now. Lou has, what, close to a thousand stolen bases. And I had, what, one third of that. So, uh, lesson learned. Rock is going. Here's the throw by Munson. He's in there. He's got Fast forward to 1974. Lou's brand of daring had further altered the way the game was played. Now he was assaulting the record books. The latter part of June, you probably knew you had a good chance, uh, provided you stay healthy, and uh, the guy behind you was able to execute his job. He is going. The pitch is a strike. The throw. He is there. He did it. On September 10th, he became the single season leader in stolen bases, and he did it in front of another St. Louis speedster, Negro League legend James Cool Papa Bell. Lou says that Cool Papa started telling him some things about base stealing and base running that he had never heard before. And he looks up at Cool Papa and he says, Cool Papa, I never saw this in the book. Cool Papa Bell says, because it ain't in the book. And so when Lou sets the record, stolen base record, who's there to greet him? The legendary James Thomas Cool Papa Bell, who called St. Louis home for so many years. And as Cool Papa said, we're going to give Lou this base, because if we don't give it to him, he's going to steal it anyway. When you're looking at the pitcher, what are you looking for? Three years later, Brock chased down Ty Cobb's career steals mark that had stood for nearly 50 years. I am looking for movement, particularly on the pitcher right leg. I try to key in on that as much as I possibly can. If I see movement at all, and it, it tells me that he has made up his mind to throw home, and I try to make my move 
simultaneously with the motion in his right leg because if I don't, uh, then I have not gotten the best jump I could possibly get. By this time, he was the undisputed master of his craft. I've never known a one-on-one -on -one challenge as I've known against Lou Brock. I don't think he has any fear. I think he just decides to go. He knows he can outrun most, ba outrun most baseballs. And I think he's just relying on a little error in between the pitcher and the catcher, somewhere between the two of them. And he knows he's going to be successful 80% of the time. It was nicer playing with him than it was playing against him. Uh, I don't think I've ever uh, played against a guy or with a guy who can intimidate the opposition uh, like Lou. I know certainly when the World Series is on the line or maybe a pennant game is on the line that Brock is the guy that I want behind me. You know, it's a monumental feat about the Ty Cobb thing and everything, but uh, he is just a great overall individual, and that's the thing that I'll always remember him besides the records that he's going to break. Brock held the single-season steals record for eight years before Ricky Henderson broke it. Fourteen years after Brock passed Cobb, Ricky passed Lou on the career steals list. One record he has all to himself, over 40 years since he retired, is his 12 consecutive seasons stealing 50 or more bases. We'll be right back. He's going. The pitch is high. The throw is safe. He stole it. The throw got by the shortstop, and Brock has done it. And this is it, folks. Brock has now stolen 893. In 1978, Lou Brock had his worst season in the big leagues, batting only 221 and losing his everyday spot in left field. After discovering a flaw in his swing, Brock lit it up in spring training with a 345 average and regaining his old job. A month later, he announced he would retire at the end of the season. But first, Brock announced he wanted to orchestrate my own exodus. He did just that batting 372 well into June and making the All-Star game. All the while, Lou was closing in on a cherished baseball milestone that he got on August 13th. Reagan ball, hit off the pitcher, to the third baseman, no play, base hit, 3,000 for Lou Brock. He was the 14th man to reach 3,000, and he orchestrated the exodus he wanted. Ron Jacober covered Lou and was a longtime friend, and says Brock was driven to go out on a high note after that disappointing 78 season. His dedication to his craft was just truly remarkable. He took that to heart, and uh, he wanted to prove that I'm, I, I'm still a good ball player. He hit over 300. I think he only stole 20 or 21 bases this last year, but he hit over 300, you know. So he, he was amazing in that regard. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to join in all the festivities and to rub shoulders with some of the greatest players who have ever played Major League Baseball. He capped off his career in 1985, making the Hall of Fame in his first year of eligibility. Former teammate Al Rabowski remembered Lou as a Hall of Fame teammate as well. And I had great teammates, great teammates, but Lou was special. He became more than a teammate, became my mentor. My relationship with Lou was so special. You know, I asked the kids, I said, I hope I was as good a friend to him as he was to me. What's all-star outfielder Lou Brock looking for in the Yellow Pages? Results. That's why we advertise our business here. Under Flores. Lou was well prepared for life after baseball. He owned a florist shop, and he let his fingers do the walking for it in a Yellow Pages commercial. He was a spokesman for Converse shoes, both for baseball use and even off-the-field wear. Vest Soda created Brock-a-Pop 
featuring Lou on every can. And then there was the Bracabella, the umbrella hat he popularized in St. Louis and owned the patent for. But Brock evolved into a philanthropist. He created a scholarship fund for less fortunate students. Lindenwood University honored Lou for his contributions by naming their baseball and softball facilities for him. You can't miss it. It's the one with his statue outside. Of course, he's honored outside of Bush Stadium as well. And then there's the work he's done in the Christian community with his wife, Jackie. Another guy who knows a little something about giving back to the St. Louis community spoke about Lou Brock. A leader must give up to go up. And he demonstrated that if you wanted to be great, you had to serve. Then this is probably my favorite, and Lou certainly possessed the law of Big Mo, momentum. Momentum is a leader's best friend. Lou was one of those unique players who could change the momentum of a game with his legs as well as his bat. And ultimately, a real leader possesses the law of victory. Leaders find a way for the team to win. And then finally, there's the law of legacy. A leader's lasting value is measured by succession. And Lewis Clark Brock was a winner, both on and off the field. Lou, I thank you so much for sharing your gift with the world. You brought us joy. It was a pleasure and an honor to be in your presence. Rest in peace, my friend. He's second all-time in stolen bases, a six-time All-Star, and a two-time world champion, Lou Brock. Lou, I've often wondered what it feels like when you get out there on that field and you've got 40 or 50,000 people in this place chanting, Lou, Lou, Lou. Well, sometimes it's uh, embarrassing to you because uh, uh, you just about know why they're, sh they're chanting that. Uh, they really want you to go. <laughs> the final years of his journey were unkind to Lou, but he handled it with his trademark grit Can and grace. In a cruel irony, an infection led to the amputation of one of his legs. Yet the following opening day, there he was, rising to throw out the ceremonial first pitch. A year later, he was diagnosed with cancer in his blood. But before long, doctors said the cancer was gone. It was another win for Brock, but the battles took their toll. The last time we saw him, in June, the body was frail, but the smile was still there. His wife, Jackie, summed up this great man's life. Lou never turned down a commitment or said, I can't make it. If he said he was going to be there, he had the character of God to keep his word. He did what he said he would do. Fortitude was a word that defined Lou Brock. He was determined to do all that he could do. That was Lou Brock. That was your friend, your father, your brother. I believe I can say confident that Lou has found his resting place, that God has received him and said, come on in, son, you good and faithful servant. Now take My your rest. Gratitude, all that I am and ever hope to be. Thank you.